Hello, I'm Dr. Irene Stein, and I'll be the host for this research symposium session titled Teaching Self-Care to Mental Health Professionals by Shira Jones. We're excited to have you join us today to hear Shira's presentation. The chat window will be open during the session, so feel free to participate or ask questions. Shiro will address the chat questions during the last five minutes of the presentation. Please welcome Shira. Um, Shira Jones is earning her PsyD with a um, mental health um, specializ with a specialization in mental health administration. She's held a license in professional counseling since 2011. And currently she works at an elementary school as a military and family life counsel counselor. Um, she's, this is a part of her applied doctoral project and she's um, just finished up her proposal. I'm proud to have been her chair. And um, I turn this over to Sh Shira. Um, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Stein, for that, inner, um, for that introduction. And thank you to everyone for making time um, to hear me speak on, um, on the subject of self-care and mental health professionals. I became interested in this topic when I was working at a treatment center. And so one of my privileges was working with students desiring to enter the field of mental health. Of mental health. Um, one woman that kind of comes to mind is a, um, was a military veteran about 15 years older than myself. And at the end of one week, um, she had decided that the field and the work was not for her. I believe this was done in part because she was not able to take appropriate self-care. Um, this morning, I will discuss why self-care is important for mental health professionals give a brief definition and history of the concept of self-care, and then introduce self-care as a process using the three A's of awareness, acceptance, and action. A mental health clinician is um, called on to accompany clients as they work on improving their lives by dealing with trauma and addressing mental illnesses this, can, this has to be done in a compassionate yet detached way. Um, research has shown that um, the same level of functioning and skills that make an individual a good mental health professional also make that same individual vulnerable to um, negative outcomes such as declining physical and mental health difficulties in personal and professional lives, making errors in client care and leaving the field earlier than expected. Um, it also has been shown that the same stressors that um, may lead to negative outcomes and consequences have the capacity to lead to positive consequences such as uh, passion satisfaction, personal transformation, and vicarious resilience. Self-care is thought to be um, one of the variables leading to the um, leading to whether a stressor is um, is used for growth or triggering of decline. Um, so something that I had that I came to realize is that in the state of Texas, when you look at education and training, it takes about eight years to get a licensure. Many individuals will leave the field in five. So um, and so that I found that I found heartbreaking. Self-care traditionally has been defined as a set of skills or um, traits used to um, facilitate health and wellness. Self-care was thought to fall into several um, different areas, which include psychological, physical, 
spiritual, social, self-development, relationship with colleagues and loved ones, as well as work-life balance. More recently, researchers are coming to view self-care as a process of identifying a need and getting that need met in a variety, um, in a responsible way. When looking at their research, um, it, became aware, it, it became aware to me that self-care can be facilitated through the three-step change process of awareness, acceptance, and action. Awareness is the first step in any self-care process. The goal is to become aware of what one desires, prefers, wants, and needs. In other words, um, what is present and missing and how important is that to health and wellness for an individual? Awareness can be reached through any self-reflection process such as journaling, um, speaking with a support person, prayer, meditation, um, going for a walk, and simply taking a deep breath. Um, it's important to remain flexible and choose a method of awareness that works for, um, that may work for the person uh, desiring to take appropriate self-care. Some questions that one may think of um, when they're looking to any awareness process is what are some things that they've used previously to, um, to come into contact with wants and needs, as well as what are some methods that maybe one has heard about, like on TV or trending or from a friend that one would be willing to try. The second step in the process is acceptance. The goal of acceptance is to loosen resistance to one's current reality. It's important to note that acceptance does not mean that one likes the situation or what has popped up, but just that one um, is willing to work with this as reality. Um, it's similar to what a clinician may face when working with a client who's um, resistant to treatment or having a difficult time. Um, one can move into acceptance by acknowledging without judgment what's going on with them, um, him or her, and this can be done in a variety of ways, such as self-compassion practices, asking for support um, from an encouraging um, person in one circle, um, as well as journaling. When working in acceptance or to increase this, um, what one um, may ask him or herself, what kind of is objectionable about the need? Like what is the difficulty in, um, what's the difficulty in facing this particular piece of one's reality? Um, Research also uses what's called um, the best friend tactic. And so what one does is pretend as if a loved one or friend comes and speaks to oneself from that place of compassion and nurturing. The final, uh, the final step in the process is action planning. Well, it's action, and then I have planning in parentheses it's noted that any um, plan has higher ability or may be more successful if appropriate planning um, takes place. The goal of action is to develop steps to using one's resources to get a need met appropriately. One can take appropriate action when they are able to match a need in a balanced way as one takes responsibility and resources into account. Um, it's important to, um, to think of action as anything that facilitates healthy, a healthy response to, um, to a stressor or to what needs that may come up. And so common needs are eating, exercise, and or movement, and then resting to include sleep and downtime, just kind of 
decompressing and doing things that are enjoy for enjoyment. Helpful hints for the action part of the um, of this process is making a plan using um, the popular SMART um, goals, as well as enlisting accountability from support people. Questions to kind of think about as preparing an action plan or working in this to serve a need so that one has had previously, and kind of jotting down or brainstorming three ways to get this need met um, in a healthy and encouraging way. I also think it would be important to ask oneself what are five names of people in your current support circle and think about how they can be helpful in um, in taking appropriate self-care. I know that I learn best when um, when concepts and processes are kind of have an example linked to them. So just hypothetically, if um, throughout the last couple of weeks, I noticed in my journaling time that I'm feeling overwhelmed and isolated, especially with social distancing, um, with social distancing going on. And so I noticed this, this pattern of anxiety and loneliness. Um, acceptance, so that would be the awareness piece of journaling. The acceptance piece would be acknowledging the fact that I have a hard time with feeling overwhelmed and isolated, especially when I think about clients that I'm working with, imagining that they are having a hard time. So kind of, you know, um, you know, some negative messages or some core beliefs that I may have is that I don't deserve to have this need because my clients are suffering more than myself. Moving in acceptance may look like going and speaking about this with this trusted support. Um, with a um, support person. Um, and kind of being open to what she may say. I know personally I have a hard time receiving compassion from others. And so that's why I find a support person super helpful. An action plan would be making commitments to my support person and allowing her to kind of call me out on it. So one of the things that I have had to do is turn the phone off at five. Um, funny story, my, <laughs> my support person was checking up, so she actually called the work phone. And when I answered, we had to talk <laughs> about was this keeping with my action plan or not, and what I could do to kind of cross that barrier. In conclusion, thank you guys very much for listening uh, to my presentation about a topic that I'm very passionate about. And we have about 10 minutes left for questions um, or comments, I'm guessing. Hi, there is um, a couple of questions in the chat. So I'm going to read, read through them. Um, well, first of all, this isn't quite a question, but Gail Brindell says, your presentation will be so helpful in my job as a county wellness coordinator, especially now. I agree, is very timely, thank you. Um, Peggy Sundstrom writes, Shira, it strikes me that your research findings may be applicable to other kinds of first responders, not just mental health practitioners. Have you thought about where else your research findings might be applied? Yes. And so the um, one, like, I am doing a qualitative um, research design. And so there are currently, um, there are currently a lot of research and um, about other first responders, there seems to be a gap in what applies specifically to mental health professionals. I think it's just kind of assumed that the needs are similar. Um, my research kind of looks at the fact that a mental health professional may have different needs than, say, a police officer or doctor or um, other first responders, which is why the scope is so narrow. Right. Marjorie Estevels asks, professionals usually seek to be 
to be positive in the work environment. So it can be difficult to know when a colleague is suffering from burnout. Your discussion of having a support person is awesome, but in case where one has not been designated, do you have tips for work friends to recognize when it's time to share some warmth and safe, safety to share? Or is it not helpful to reach out when it seems a work friend is struggling a lot? I think that um, it's really important to remember that connection is very important even at work. Um, as a mental health professional, there are just certain things that um, we tend to be more in tune with um, due to training and education. And so I know, especially now where I work, we are all very open to the fact that um, we may be indeed called upon to support a, um, a colleague and it's important for that to be done like in a safe place and without judgment. Um, I have found in the research that um, workplaces where leadership is involved in taking appropriate self-care and being a support person, the organization as a whole is often um, healthier and does a better job on that front. Great. Um, Gail Brindell asks, how will you conduct your study? What will your methodology and design be? So I am doing a rapid systematic literature review, um, which is a comprehensive, uh, um, a comprehensive and unbiased review of current, um, of current um, research, you know, kind of articles and things that are out there and asking three questions. One, what are self-care skills um, or, or what are self-care topics or concepts that are that lead to positive outcomes for mental health professionals to how may those um, self-care um, components be addressed with mental health professionals and then a third question what are some things that need to be taken into account with daily application of whatever the findings are i hope that answers your question yes and you're doing an applied doctoral project I that's, am. That's great. Um, Dr. Jesse Harkins asks, what have you found related to the effects model, uh, related to the effects modeling self-care for clients? Um, it's, kind of, it's very interesting that you mentioned that. There's one study in particular, and I apologize, I don't remember the author's name, um, but they, um, and so what they found is that clinicians who practice mindfulness um, and self-care, even if they did not speak about this with their clients, when rated by clients, were more satisfied with the services they receive. Um, and so I found that very interesting that even though it's often thought as a very self, you know, a very selfish thing, can kind of have a positive ripple in the clinician's immediate environment. Um, Kelly Stewart asks, um, how do you anticipate this degree or journey will shape your next professional steps? What do you see ahead for you? Um, it's my goal um, to work with training mental health professionals. I wanted the, One of the things that I enjoyed at my previous job was getting to work with students and kind of see their growth and development. Um, I think that's something I'm definitely kind of looking toward uh, as a next step in my career, either with research or training or teaching, something along those lines. Thank you very much for asking. I'm, I'm, I'm reading, reading through this. Um, like there's so many messages, I can't read them all. So uh, <laughs> excuse me for people. Well, I'm not kidding you. Renee Humphrey says, thank you, Shira, for sharing with your personal journaling, your personal journaling situations. This is something I need to work on. Do you do other meetings or, or support groups? Um, I apologize. I don't understand. Like personally or professionally? Um, answer both. Okay. <laughs> I don't know. Um, <laughs> So, um, personally, um, I... Oh, both, both, yes. Okay. So, so, 
personally, I um, I am a part of a um, of a religious community, and so they're like a group of close people that kind of check in on me and make sure that I'm taking appropriate self care, and I kind of do the same in turn. Um, professionally, at where I am at, we are divided into about three to five individuals. And so my, um, and I know in my small group, we are very active. Like this morning, they were kind of checking in and like, have you had breakfast or you, you know? So I found that um, super helpful. I know one of the things in my community I've been able to do is work with individuals who are having a difficult time, well, clinicians having a difficult time um, with self-care and kind of encouraging you know, them to make positive steps in that year. Um, a comment from Yolanda Smith. Thank you for this presentation. So true on your findings. I removed myself from a job after burnout. I had an emotional attachment to my client that was not healthy for me. It hurt me so much to leave her. And then uh, Gail Brunell says, um, and this was, was related to something that, that you, you have talked about, um, about leadership. How do you suggest getting leadership buy-in? Oh. We might have lost Shira. Um, I, I think Shira will come come back on in in a, in a minute, and yeah. I'm going to read read through here. Um, um, thank you for sharing your specific experiences and answering our question. Th this gives many of us a window on a work environment we can't see direct directly. And then I have one of those self-care support circles here at Ashford with colleagues. One of them is here today. I am sure we will be discussing this later. Thank you for sharing your findings. Um, hey, Shira, do you see self-care becoming an advocated practice within work place onboarding in the future. As I was listening to, um, to her talk, I'm thinking of, of how that would apply to me and all of us who are, you know, perhaps, um, you know, uh, staying home or self quarantining or, you know, having to, um, uh, having to, work while we're worried about maybe loved ones or um hi shira hello i'm so sorry about that poor connection that that's fine um i was just um reading some of some of the chats um here's here's one that that came in just recently Shira, do you see self-care becoming an advocated practice within workplace onboarding in the future? Um, there's a bit of uncertainty. Um, there's a bit of uncertainty about the steps that may be taken with an organization, um, organizational um, level, mostly because the findings have shown that even though, um, even though the um, leadership is important when taking self-care, the diverse needs of clinicians um, may prevent it from, um, you know, from organizations getting involved in a detailed level other than offering, you know, EAP services and things along those lines. Great. We have time for a couple more questions, which I have queued up here. 
Um, Gail Grinnell says, Shira, with your experience in the military, will you be sharing your findings with military organizations or the Veterans Administration? Self-care is especially, um, self-care especially for chronic pain is important in this population. Yes, and I think just by the nature of how I'm positioned in the community, I think I've already been kind of working on a one-to-one -one basis with individuals, um, especially um, with me being situated in a school setting. I'm having an opportunity to speak with um, different military personnel and even some of the teachers who are former um, military persons. So very interesting um, consideration. Thank you. And then one, one more um, from Paul Schultz. Thank you for your presentation. I am the husband of an infectious infection control nurse working 10 hours a day right now in the hospital setting. Are there specific questions I can ask my wife when she gets done with work to help with her self-care? Um, I think ask, just kind of asking open-ended questions are very, can be very, very helpful. Um, as well as um, self-compassion practices. I know one question that, um, or one question in particular um, that I read um, about is kind of asking an individual, you know, how can I help? You know, expressing concern and love and consideration and then saying, how can I help? Well, unfortunately, you know, the, we're out of time. Uh, thank you so much, Shira, for your presentation and for all of you for joining in this session today. Recordings of these presentations will be available in June to be accessed through the conference website. Oh, thank you guys very much for um, coming and hearing me speak and all of your great questions. It was very, very, very timely. Thank you for starting us off. Thank you.